you should not be preaching without praying. But having prayed, we go to preach. We preach for the glory of God and we preach for the salvation of sinners. And that salvation you can con consider in its entire scope. The bringing in, the bringing on, and under God, the bringing home of his beloved people. We are evangelicals. I know that language has been horribly degraded. I know that there are questions about whether or not we still want to use that language. But in its best and truest sense, we are unashamedly evangelical men. And that means that all our preaching ought to be evangelical. We are ministers of the new covenant. We are not, for example, Old Testament prophets. We are uh, not to preach in such a way that, for example, an imam or a rabbi might say, well, I could have done that. We are to be preaching evangelically always. There is to be that the tincture of the gospel about everything that we do by way of our private and public ministry of the word. No one should ever be able to confuse us for anything other than a minister of Jesus Christ. But we also need to be evangelistic. And I'm not trying to say that every sermon and every conversation must always and only be explicitly evangelistic in the sense that the only thing we ever do is go after souls and nothing else. I would hope that there would be enough gospel in any evangelical sermon that someone would be able to say, I know that I need to be saved and I know who is willing and able to save me. But there are also times, and I would suggest and hope many times, when both publicly and more formally and privately and more informally, we are being deliberately and definitely evangelistic. We are fishing for souls. We are soul winners in the best and most direct sense of that language. And it's been my privilege, occasionally my dubious privilege, to hear many evangelistic sermons over the course of the years. And some of them have been genuinely and objectively awful. Sometimes when we have visiting preachers in the congregation at home, I would encourage them and say, listen, the vast majority of our unconverted hearers are going to be here on the Lord's Day morning. If you want to preach evangelistically, then please preach so then. And say, oh, that's great. I'd love to preach evangelistically for you. Have you ever heard a sermon that even maybe 20, 30, 40 minutes in, you don't want to look at the faces of the other people because and you're hoping they're not looking at your face? What? I mean, there is one legendarily bad evangelistic sermon. It's so bad, it ruins other evangelistic sermons because you can hear a good gospel sermon and if someone were there on that occasion, you might say, oh, wasn't that sweet? That was great preaching. The gospel was... Do you remember that guy who came and preached that sermon that time? It was so bad, it actually undermines, because the only time you think about evangelistic preaching, you think about the guy who preached that sermon. Sometimes they're random. Sometimes they're just dull. They're tame. They're irrelevant. They're misdirected. They're cold. They're boring. They're even insulting. Almost to the point that you might say, it would be better not to have done that than to have done it so badly. So how do we learn to be evangelists, publicly and privately, with regard to our words? Well, I want to turn you to the example of the Apostle Paul in Thessalonica. Now, this is a more formal discourse, and it is delivered in a synagogue of the Jews. But I still think that what we look at here gives us some guidance, some direction, some very sweet encouragement with regard to you and your words as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As very often 
Paul arrives in a place with the marks of suffering in his body. There's more than one occasion where he turns up to preach in one place with physical scars, perhaps even bleeding wounds that are the consequence of his preaching that gospel in the place before. You, if you are going to be a faithful minister of the gospel, will stand up on many occasions with wounds and the temptation will be in some way to dilute or to uh, pause in terms of faithful ministry. The Apostle Paul does not do so. Like his apostolic brothers, he considers it an honor to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. And it is beautiful to consider that having preached the gospel in one place and suffered for it, he turns up in the next place and does exactly the same thing all over again. So, how does Paul preach when he comes to Thessalonica? And what can we learn for our formal and more informal interactions? Who does Paul preach? What does Paul preach? And why does Paul preach? First of all then, how does Paul preach? He, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Paul preaches as a man who is anchored in the scriptures of God. Now that doesn't mean that he invariably stands up and says, please will you turn in your scroll to Thess Acts chapter, whatever it may be. And, and it doesn't mean that if you're talking to somebody over a cup of coffee in a coffee shop, that you would stand up in front of them, take a gracious step back and say, please open your Bible at Acts chapter 17. But Paul is invariably rooted in the word of God. It is revelation, which is his invariable touchstone. Now he's eminently adaptable in that regard. But whether or not he's in Thessalonica before the Jews or in Athens before the Greeks, it is always what God has said that forms the foundation and the starting point for Paul's ministry. I mean, even if you read on through Acts and chapter 17, people often just skip to Paul on Mars Hill and say, see how he starts with natural revelation. Why is Paul on Mars Hill? It's because when he arrived in Athens, he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And that's what stirred their interest and gave Paul the opportunity on Mars Hill. And what does he do? He drives straight back toward a crucified and risen Jesus. This then is a man who has confidence in the gospel as the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, because in the good news concerning Jesus Christ, the power and wisdom of God are revealed, the truth of God. From faith to faith, just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Luke paints Paul in action. You could have looked through the window of the Thessalonican synagogue and you would have seen this man preaching. We said yesterday, wouldn't you have loved to hear Paul if his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel was that it, it should have been saved? Wouldn't you have wanted to be in the room with Paul pleading? Well, you can actually get a little step closer here. You can actually watch through the window from a distance, perhaps, but you can see and hear Paul preaching. And Luke paints the portrait of Paul the preacher in four vivid colors. There are key verbs here in this text. Notice what Paul does. He reasoned with them. He explained to them. He demonstrated for them and he preached or proclaimed to them. And this gives us a wonderful framework, not just for our pulpit labors, but for our other gospel engagements when we are seeking to win souls. So what is Paul doing? First of all, he is reasoning with them. Now this doesn't mean that Paul is discussing with them as if everybody's got a valid opinion and I'll give you yours and you can give me mine and we'll just figure out whether or not we can agree or if we need to agree to disagree. 
What this means is to argue from the word of God. Paul is doing humanly what the Lord God himself says he wants to do in Isaiah chapter 1. Come now and let us reason together. Let us bring these matters to the bar of divine truth and see whether or not they measure up to that standard. Paul is going to therefore walk through the issues. He's going to address the questions that these men and women in Thessalonica might have. He's going to use the word of God to shed light on different views and opinions. But whatever it is that someone may think, whatever it is that someone may believe, whatever it is that someone may conclude, Paul is always going to bring that back to the standard of God's word. And so publicly, he is going to reason these things out. Let's see how that holds up once God has spoken. Then he's going to explain to them. He's going to open the truth up in such a way that it can be readily understood. There's something in this language akin to anatomical dissection. I don't know if you're still allowed to do that in schools here. Um, I think there are occasions when we can do it at home. Uh, sometimes they now have to do it on screens. You know, you get the light pen and you put it down the frog diagram and the frog folds open in front of you. Um, back in, in, in the, what some would call the good old days, you could actually do it with a proper knife. But Paul's going to do that here with regard to the truth. He's going to make something fully known. Now again, Luke uses his words carefully in Luke chapter 24 and verse 33. No, it's 32, sorry. Did our not, not our heart burn within us when Jesus talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? That's what Paul is doing in Thessalonica. He is opening it up. He's slicing and peeling back the skin. Then he's cutting through the next layer and he's peeling things back. And by degrees, stage by stage, he's driving down into the depths so that the whole thing is clearly laid out before you so you can see the anatomy of what it is that you are dealing with. Paul is reasoning. Paul is explaining. Paul is demonstrating. He's setting the truth forth wisely. It's, if you read the Puritans, and if you're here and you're not reading the Puritans, why are you here? But if you read the Puritans, what's one of the things that they will typically do? By the way, I'm not suggesting that we should always and invariably preach now as the Puritans did. But one of the things that they do, and it tends to lie on the surface of their sermons in a way that we might not choose to, is that they will say, so here's your doctrine, they're working through it, and then objection. Answer one, answer two, answer three, so on, answer 427. <laughs> objection two, objection three. This is what they're doing. They're demonstrating. They're asking, what questions are going to come up in your minds as a result of what I have just said? And they're predicting that that is going to be the case. And having gauged how you're going to challenge or what you might then inquire, they've already provided an answer. Paul does something similar. He, he understands how someone might react to something that he said. And it's as if he'd say, now, I know what you're thinking, but actually I mean this. And that's something that Paul is doing here in Thessalonica. And by addressing these objections and answering the questions that naturally arise, Paul is going to prove the coherence and the validity of what he's saying. He's not going to give them a way out. Now, let me ask just as an aside, do you talk to ordinary people enough to know the questions that your preaching is going to raise? <laughs> 
I'm only exaggerating a little bit when I tell you that I've heard someone say in the pulpit something like this. Now, I know what you're all thinking. <laughs> Surely that's the aorist. I can almost certainly guarantee <laughs> that whatever it is they're thinking, it isn't that. <laughs> hang, hang on. When Artaxerxes was in power, surely he made a neat note. That's not where they're going. They're asking typically far more earthy questions. There's typically, it's not illogical. You're not talking down to people. But you need to understand the kind of issues and questions that the people to whom you are speaking actually want answered. And that may be very different if you're in a gathered congregation on the Lord's Day morning or evening to if you're knocking on somebody's door and talking to them or sitting down with a neighbor and explaining to them who the Lord Jesus is. Paul can answer the questions because Paul has thought about what the questions will be. He reasons, he explains, he demonstrates and he preaches. This Jesus whom I preach or proclaim. So it's not that there is simply this sort of you know, big cannon that is pointed at the Thessalonians and Paul just keeps pulling the firing pin and off it goes. But he does reason, he does explain, he does demonstrate and by way of that careful process he comes to the point at which he can unequivocally and unashamedly make the clear proclamation concerning Jesus Christ declaring on the basis of that foundation his true convictions and his unavoidable conclusions. Now, again, when you look at that language, reasoning, explaining, demonstrating, and in some measure preaching or proclaiming, it is important that we do not think that Paul is merely lecturing. If you'd been looking through the window in the synagogue in Thessalonica, you would not have seen a man, for example, with his hands in his pockets. You would not have seen a man who was speaking in a monotone. You would not have seen a man who was immobile, whose face was impassive. Have you ever seen somebody who is wrestling in this way? It's, it's hard even, once you get into the spirit of this, he's reasoning, he's explaining, he's demonstrating. The whole man is alive with the intensity and the urgency of the moment. Now, if I were right up close with some of you and, and having a normal conversation, and I were doing what I'm doing now, it would be freakish. There are different environments in which those different postures and gestures and expressions are going to be more helpful or less. But when you're sitting down with somebody or standing up before a group, is it clear that you're in earnest, brothers? Do they know that you want to do them good? Do they understand that you're not just trying to win an argument, that you're trying to win a soul? They might not express it that way, but there have been times, and, and sometimes those red herrings, uh, you do have that phrase here, don't you? Yeah, okay, good. Um, Otherwise you think, what on earth does he do in the UK? But people will ask questions and they're not the kind of questions that Paul is trying to answer. They're the ones that are intended to divert you. And you might get diverted and at the end of it you've demonstrated everything that you want to demonstrate and they're as far from the kingdom of God as they ever were before. And you might have thought, yep, I think I've proved my intellectual superiority but I'm not persuaded I brought them face to face with Jesus Christ as Savior. That's what Paul is trying to do. The whole man preaching to whole men. You know the Baxter phrase, preaching as a dying man to dying men and never like to preach again. That's true, Paul does that, but Paul's also preaching as a living man to living men. He's right there on the spot. He's looking people in the eye. He is engaging with them. He's working with them. He's watching the frowns go across their faces when he tells them certain things. And he's bringing in an illustration. He's digging down another level. He wants to make sure that they get it. 
He's drawing things out of the scriptures. He's making things plain. He's pressing home the convictions, the conclusions, and the consequences of what God has said with regard to eternal life or everlasting damnation. And that is how Paul is preaching. Now, who does Paul preach? Who does Paul preach? And this we cannot get away from because Paul is using these four tools to sculpt a lively image which is taking place before the ears of his hearers. I, I say that deliberately. When Paul said to the Galatians, I've set Christ before you, I've placarded him, I've held him up obviously, that wasn't because he decided that Galatia needed some kind of gospel puppet show. It was because he preached in such a way that the gospel, as it were, came before their eyes. You can see with your ears if the Holy Spirit is helping you to preach. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's sculpting this gospel image because the message that he preaches in Thessalonica revolves around and terminates on this Jesus who is the Christ. He, he is the one who has been promised from the beginning. I'm not saying that Paul began in what we would call Genesis 3.15, but it's quite possible that he would have done. But over time, this is the one who becomes clear to us as the one who has been appointed and anointed for salvation. There is a divinely designated deliverer. God has made him known. God has promised him from the beginning. The Christ of covenant love was told that he would come. And over time, the, 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 the clarity becomes more and more distinct. And sometimes as the history begins to dip, the prophetic expectation begins to rise. Have you ever traced it almost chronologically through the Old Testament? as the line of David in reality seems to get more and more watery and wicked, the prophetic expectation rises higher and higher. As the line of David seems to be dissipating, yet the expectation of a king of David's line becomes crisper and warmer and clearer and sweeter. And then there's that silence. Who is this Christ? And then one comes. The voice of a man crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And he sees Jesus of Nazareth coming toward him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Christ has a name. The Christ has a face. It is Jesus of Nazareth who lives and who dies. He is Messiah. You see, Paul's gospel is not fuzzy. It's not clever. It's not so clever that people go away thinking, wow, that guy's got a brain on him, but I've got no idea what he was saying. It's not remote and it's not incomplete. The promised redeemer is none other than Jesus himself. And taking account of the fact that he's in a Thessalonian synagogue and not on a street in Grand Rapids or wherever else it may be, Paul chips away in the course of his sermon with the tools of reason and explanation and demonstration and proclamation until the Christ becomes clear. This Jesus is the Savior. There's a sense in which Paul's almost preaching the whole Old Testament in one sermon. We don't even have to do all those hard yards. The, the Christ who is Jesus lies on the surface of our New Testaments. I'm not saying we shouldn't and couldn't preach him from the Old Testament, but we ought to be doing precisely the same as the Apostle. The New Testament gleams with the glory of God in Christ Jesus. You know that glorious phrase, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. That's our ministry. 
Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Notice, please, that Paul does not preach about Jesus. Paul preaches Jesus as the Christ. That may seem like a fine distinction. I'm not always sure I know where the line is that divides preaching about and preaching him but I have heard people preach about Jesus and I have wanted them to preach Jesus to me. Uh, maybe better felt than telt in that sense. I know about him, but you need to make me care about him. You've told me true things about me, but have you placarded Christ before someone as crucified? Paul does not preach himself. And Paul does not even preach about Messiah. He preaches Jesus as the Christ. Now, what then does Paul preach? In preaching a who, what does Paul preach? And it seems evident if you look at the, the focal point of his reasoning and his explaining and his demonstrating and his preaching, that all the lines of whatever parallels and proofs and principles and precepts and promises Paul is bringing to bear terminate upon the life and the death and the resurrection of this Jesus who is the Christ. This Jesus, notice, is the one who had to suffer and rise again from the dead. That's how you know who the Christ is. Now, who suffered and died and rose again from the dead? Jesus of Nazareth. Ergo, this Christ is this Jesus. This Jesus is this Christ. And the apostles delight at times. Uh, Peter does it. Paul does it. In a this is that kind of structure. This thing that you're seeing, this is that which God has spoken from before. So this Jesus is that Christ. And all the lines of revelation meet in him. And all the things that compel and consume and drive you forward to the inescapable conclusions concern the sufferings unto death and the rising from the dead. This is required for salvation. What is the heart of our good news? Substitution. Substitution. Now we want to be careful with Substitution is the gospel. You always then need to explain, don't you, what substitution is and who for whom. But the sufferings unto death, that there is a Christ, and you notice that he had to suffer. That divine mustness. It is necessary. It cannot be otherwise. If a sinner is to be reconciled to God, it must needs be that someone should suffer and die in our place and take the wrath that our sins deserve and suffer the stripes that our transgressions should receive. The curse and the wrath of Almighty God fell upon His beloved Son who had taken flesh and blood. The blood that he shed, that and that only is the pardon for our sins. In him and in him only can the crimson-hearted sinner be made as white as snow. It is atonement. He is the Lamb of God who is slain. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And you are damned until Christ has been condemned in your place. And you are lost unless and until you have faith in the Jesus who died in the place of the ungodly. Who did not die because we were good, but because we were not. Who did not die because we wanted God, but in order to bring us to God. And nothing short of his real, actual death under the curse of the God of heaven and earth, the drinking of the cup to its very dregs will suffice for the salvation of sinners. Amen. 
Brothers, the Jesus that we preach is a Jesus who suffers to the point of death. And that language hides in it. It doesn't so much hide, carries with it all the agonies and the awfulness of those gospel records of his last days and hours. As that trajectory of his reaches its fearful and dark pinnacle on the cross outside Jerusalem. And I think it's very proper for us, while not forgetting, as the saying goes, that the soul of his sufferings were the sufferings of his soul. Brothers, he bore our sins in his body. You look at the man, the God man, the one person, the two natures. And the cross holds him before your eyes. Uh, the popular conceptions, he's up there somewhere. The most likely reality, the cross hangs the crucified man so you can look into his face and sneer. You can look into the eyes of Jesus as you read the pages of your Bible and you can have placarded before you Jesus Christ as the crucified one. The Christ must suffer and Jesus so suffered. And praise God, that's not the end of the story. Because the Christ had to suffer, yes. But there's an equal necessity that the Christ must rise again from the dead. Now, I was talking with a friend yesterday and saying, yeah, you read through the book of the Acts, the emphasis that there is on the resurrection of the Jesus, of the Christ. <laughs> Absolutely so. Very often the summary of apostolic preaching is that they preach the resurrection of Jesus or some phrase of that nature. And we agreed immediately and wholeheartedly that you cannot have a resurrection until you've first had a crucifixion. To preach the resurrection is not to overlook the sufferings unto death. It is to take full and proper account of them and then to declare that the same Jesus who suffered and died and spent three days in the grave was raised again from the grave in power on the third day. That God has declared him with power to be his son by the resurrection from the dead. And so Paul in Thessalonica, as he reasons, as he explains, as he demonstrates, as he preaches, as he carves out Christ Jesus before the eyes and the ears of his Thessalonian congregation, shows a man who is triumphant. It's at least one of the reasons, there are many, why we do not have a crucifix. Because our Jesus is crucified but risen again. He is not still on the cross. He doesn't need the help of a Mary or anybody else. He is risen in triumph from the grave. He is sitting now at the right hand of the majesty on high. He has been accepted and we are accepted in him. The resurrection is God's receipt, if you will, that the bill has been paid, that the price has been given in its entirety. It declares his true identity. How do you know that this Jesus is the Christ? Because every other so-called Christ, even if he dies on a cross, doesn't rise again. This man, he does. That's how we know. It's assuring us of his intercession because the man who died now lives again and lives forevermore and he is at the right hand of the majesty on high and he is interceding for the people for whom he shed his blood. In this lies the seeds of Christian hope because this Christ is coming again. He's come once to deal with sin and he's coming again apart from sin for salvation. The hope of the believer is what? That we shall be raised together with him. That having borne the image of the man of dust, so also we must bear the image of the heavenly man. And Paul handles his Bible like Christ. You remember how the Lord taught his disciples on that Emmaus road? You hear the echo not just in Paul's language, but in what Paul is doing here. How often did the Lord tell his disciples that he must suffer, that he must die, that he must 
rise again. And over and over again, they didn't get it. Until, by the inward working of the Holy Spirit, they did. Christ himself showed from Moses and the prophets that these things were needful. He opened their eyes that they might understand. And he did so by the same Spirit who has been given to us. Are you reading your Bible like an apostle? What I would call an apostolic hermeneutic. I know it's a mouthful, but do you read your Bible like Christ taught his apostles to read their Bibles? So that you can say, I see him here, and I see him here, and I can reason, and I can explain, and I can demonstrate, and I will preach that the Christ has to suffer and rise again from the dead. And that this Jesus, this Jesus, is that Christ and the Saviour of all who put their faith in him. This divine necessity is the hope and happiness of sinners. The salvation of every one of God's elect is secured by the promised and prophesied servant of God who lays down his life for his sheep and takes it up again. There is only one fulfiller of the word of God. And that fulfillment is pure, perfect, entire and saving. So Paul preaches by way of this reasoning, this explaining, this demonstrating, this proclaiming. He is speaking of the Christ. And he shows us a Christ who suffers and dies for the salvation of his people. And he shows us a Christ who having suffered even to death, rises again from the grave in glorious testimony to the accomplishment of his saving purposes. Why does Paul preach? Does he preach because he's cleverer than everybody in Thessalonica? Does he preach because he's got a seminary degree and he needs to prove that it was worthwhile? Does he preach because it's his job? Does he preach because it's the only way that he can put bread on the table? There's a lot of answers to that. But there's one here in this text to which I would direct your attention. Some of them were persuaded. Some of them were persuaded. That's what Paul's been aiming at. Actually, what he's been aiming at is that all of them would be persuaded. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, persuaded himself of the terror of the Lord. He persuades others. You could almost pour into that language of persuasion the hot edge of all the reasoning and explaining and demonstrating and proclaiming. That's what it is for, that men might be persuaded. And if I can be anachronistic for a moment, there's no truer Calvinist than the Apostle Paul. So let not a single one of us say, well, persuade." I'm a little uncomfortable with the language of persuasion. Then it's time to get apostolic, my friend, because the apostles were persuaders. Without for one moment dismissing, undermining or neglecting the work of the Holy Spirit, they set out to look into the eyes of men and women like them and to persuade them to come to Jesus Christ. That's our task as preachers. Having prayed from the depths of our heart, oh God, have mercy upon these men and women. Perhaps even if you read enough of the, the sermons of Spurgeon, he, he occasionally, it's not always, it's not every sermon, but there are times when in those recorded discourses, you can almost see the man lift his eyes to heaven and in the very moment of his preaching, he calls upon God to save those who hear. 
And he's not just trying to manipulate the people in front of him. As he reaches the climax of his sermon, there's a sense of his absolute dependence on the God of salvation to accomplish, uh, to apply the salvation that has been accomplished in Christ Jesus. And in that moment, Spurgeon at his warmest and his clearest is reasoning and he's demonstrating and he's explaining and he's proclaiming that the people in front of him may be persuaded to close with Jesus Christ. Now is that what people hear when they hear what we are preaching? Have we fallen into the trap of thinking that there ought to be no application? That's the Holy Spirit's work. No, it's our work to apply the truth. You, you might need to dig in the charges. You drop the dynamite in the holes. Brothers, the Holy Spirit, if I can put it this way, he needs to press the plunger. But I'm the man whom he has called to take the dynamite close to the heart. And so we bring the word of God to bear. And we earnestly and urgently, we entreat Again, that language from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm pleading and you're hearing God's voice in mine. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I beseech you on Christ's behalf. My friends, you might not get into someone's face, but do you know what it is to get into someone's soul? Do you persuade? Do you see where they're going to go? Some of you may be thinking this, but I want to tell you, some of you may have these doubts and fears. Some of you might think, can God save me? Some of you might think, will God save me? Some of you might think, has God rejected me? And I'm going to answer you here, and I'm going to answer you there, and I'm going to answer you there. I'm going to shut down every avenue of escape. If you try and divert over here, I'm going to bring you back. I am fixed upon Jesus Christ and God helping me. I will not let you see anyone else. I will make sure by everything that lies in me that you are shut up to Jesus Christ by the time that I have finished preaching. And if you won't have him, my hands will be clean of your blood at the day of judgment. God forbid that we should ever say that unfeelingly. Well, I did my job. I've been faithful. Over to you. Is that what you see when you look through the window of a Thessalonian synagogue? Is that what you hear when Paul is preaching on Mars Hill? <laughs> Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Let's pray. Really? You think that's how an apostle sounds when he's preaching? This man is pursuing souls. This man is pleading with men and women who have undying souls that may at any moment be ushered into the presence of Almighty God because it's appointed once to die and after that, the judgment. Paul preaches like a man in Edward's language with eternity stamped on his eyeballs. He wants to walk out of there not just with a clean conscience, because the termination of all his labors is not himself. Paul wants to walk out of there. I think he probably wept. Oh God, my heart's desire and my prayer for Israel is that they would be saved. And I've preached your son in Thessalonica and some have been persuaded. I think at that point, perhaps tears of joy. But, oh Lord, some have not. Some have not yet come to Jesus Christ. Do you pray that God would make you a persuader? <laughs> Removing the obstacles, preventing the evasion, offering encouragements to the doubting and the fearing. John Owen says it's the hardest thing when he's preaching. He says, I, I want to shake the proud. And I terrify the fearful. <laughs> and then I'm trying to encourage the fearful. And I assure the proud. <laughs>
Well, may God help us to be wise in our day. But he wants them, whoever they may be, whatever may they, they may be their disposition as they come, whatever may be their conviction as they arise, whatever may be their disposition when you sit down over the coffee, when you invite a friend into your home, when you hold a gospel Bible study, when you knock on a door, when you preach on the streets. I've heard street preachers. And they're there to damn. I know a man who said he's living in gross sin. He said, every Christian I've ever met has just told me I'm going to hell. Is that gospel ministry? Brothers, if you're a preacher of Jesus Christ, if you're a minister of the new covenant, you can go to any sinner you know. You can sit down with them with a heart full of affection and compassion. And you can, like Paul, reason, explain, demonstrate, and proclaim with the aim that you will persuade them to come to Jesus Christ just as they are, laden with their sins, repenting and believing, and Christ will make them whole. Are we pressing Christ into the hearts of the people to whom we preach? Are we doing so not because we're cleverer, not because we're wordsmiths, not because we've learned how to use logic and argument, but because we believe that by the simple, plain, earnest proclamation of the Christ who must suffer and rise again from the dead, whose name is Jesus of Nazareth, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is the preaching. These are the words by which God is pleased to bring life to those who were dead. May God so help us. Amen.